Well, back to Romans. I'm going to uh, do a series on Romans in two parts. Uh, up to Advent, September to the beginning of Advent, and then from now until Easter. But uh, Jan has prevailed upon me to change the plan slightly. So from now until the first week of Lent, then we'll do something else during our Lenten season, and I'll come back to Romans again after Easter. The text is chapter 7 of Romans, the 14th through the 25th verse, which contains, I don't know, one of my favorite or at least oft-quoted verses in Scripture. That's because I have sort of a perverse streak. But will you listen to the Spirit of God as the word comes to you? So let me say that it's the first line that really struck me about this text. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then. With my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. Do you hear what the Spirit might be saying to the church? Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death. It's a little melodramatic, I'll grant. But you know what he means, don't you? You know what he means. You set out in one direction, you have an imagination for what the right thing is to do, and somehow your actions don't measure up, or maybe it's the feelings you think you ought to have or have control over. So what's in your mind doesn't quite fit with what actually transpires in your heart or in the actions to others. Now, the obvious place to see that is, is in addictions. Almost the definition of an addiction is that we make a decision not to do something, we do it anyway. It means we're addicted to whatever it is. But let's not be too quick to say, oh, yes, those addicted people, as though everyone is not addicted to something. Some of our addictions are, I don't know, more physically or socially unacceptable than others but they all are spiritually difficult. They all put us in this place where we feel as though we do not have control. They anesthetize our particular pain or shame, and they leave things the way they are in stasis. They play out in part of a system that goes on in our hearts and minds, and it's how we just keep on keeping on. The lucky ones watch TV. The unlucky ones do things that could kill them. But in all seriousness, we all have something that shields us from that moment when we must change, when we must shift. We do things that we don't think we should do in order to drive and get the things we want. 
our feelings get the better of us. Our ego gets the better of us. You know, that, that small self that's within us that reaches out and grabs and feels like it must have something, some ability, some accolade, some, some thing that will allow us to feel as though we're complete. Always diminishing returns as we reach out. There's frustration and anger. We find it very difficult to forgive. I remember that my uh, grandmother had a sister named Trey. And uh, Trey and she apparently had quite a fight and a falling out at one point in their lives. And I remember when grandmother was 94, 95 years old, and my, uh, my mother said, uh, well, well, now, mother, are you ever going to forgive Trey? And she said, well, of course I forgive her. I just never want to see her again. <laughs> Difficult to forgive because there's that thing inside that, that got hurt, that, that possibility that maybe we're not who we think we are that gets picked at, slices us up and takes us down. We imagine pretty well that life should be different than it is that we should act or feel differently than we do. Paul would tell us that it's the law that gives us that imagination. That it's this, this gift of understanding from the Spirit of God about what we're reaching towards. The kind of life that is lived into freedom and new possibility with the Spirit of God imbuing our lives. That law gives us the imagination, and when he talks about law giving opportunity for sin, all he means is if we know the way it's supposed to be, that makes it all the harder when we don't do it. But we do continually get in that tussle between our passion and our minds, is the way Paul puts it, who will save us from this body of death. And you know... The trouble is it's worse than Paul imagined it. Because Paul has this idea that there's a mind that is disconnected a bit from the body. As though there is some way that it could control a will when we've come to understand in this day and age that that's not how the brain works. That the brain doesn't have the kind of choices that we might think. I've learned a bit about this as I've dealt with some chronic pain. I'm actually feeling freer today of chronic pain than I've felt in years because of a procedure I had done. But, but as I've read about how to deal with chronic pain, I come to understand that you can deaden the pain receptors in your body. But then your body, your brain, says, wait a minute, I, I don't feel any pain receptors. There's nothing out there. And so then your brain produces more and makes you more sensitive to pain. And it's not only physical pain that our brain does that with. The behavior we have, the things we do that sets and shapes our brain in ways that have us repeat that which we've always done. Look for the same kinds of things to occur within our lives. And the patterns go around and around. It's as though our behavior and our brain are in a symbiotic relationship, one forming the other, which forms the other back and forth. But who will save us then from this body of death? Indeed. Creation is, uh, one of the rules of creation is that, you know, Things stay still until you change it. Things moving, it stays moving until a force acts upon it. It's true of physical things, and it's true, really, of human things, if anything. A force has to act upon a system that is spinning in order for that system to change. So this business of our brains spinning around with our behavior, this business of the cycle of abuse we give to ourselves or the cycles of addiction. I mean, a force has to act upon that in order for it to shift. And 
That's what Paul is looking to understand. And what Paul would say that it is the spirit operating through the law that is the force that acts upon this body of death, this system that goes around and around. Now, of course, when Paul talks about sin and law, he's got a particular worldview in mind. And the spirits, hand, you know, behind the scenes, pulling the strings. The law of sin is that spiritual power, that substance that shifts and moves us. And what Paul understands is kind of, this is almost a, a, a theory of creation that he's putting forward, that the spirit of God, however, moves through law to change, grow, and develop our creation. A little later in, or a little later in chapter 8, he talks about the whole creation groaning in travail, waiting for the spirit that offers the law to bring about the next thing. Paul is reaching for something or pointing to something, and we have to point to it in different terms that he might but we can recognize it. That sense that in the midst of each one of our lives, in the midst of all creation, there is that creative power of God, that spirit that is interpenetrating everything that is. If you open up your eyes, listen for it, look for it, you can almost see the creation shimmer with the spirit of God. And what Paul would say is that the Spirit is acting through the law, which is a law of love, that creative love that puts value in and makes things greater and more whole, more at peace, if you will. That seems to be the goal of creation in Paul's tradition is shalom, to get to that place where the whole world operates as a seamless whole, where the Cycles of abuse and addiction have stopped and, and everybody is fitting together in harmony. This is what the law will take us towards. You now it operates in inanimate objects is I think what Paul would say. But the law operates within us. And the way it operates is we connect to the Spirit of God we are filled with the love of God and that creative power and love becomes the force which acts on our world and makes it more whole. Have you ever seen it? Have you seen in your own life something that you've done, someone else has done, that has acted upon the world and begun to change it? put value into another's life. It's one of the most exhilarating things. You want to tell the whole world, but then you have this feeling, well, I shouldn't brag. It's a beautiful thing to be able to let the love of God express itself through us. We sing a song, and we're going to sing it later, dance and sing, for the Lord God is with us. We're going to change the words next week when we do chant fest, we chant and dance and sing for spirits within us. Glory, hallelujah. Peace and justice soon will flow through us. Glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, we, it's alle, not hallelujah. It's an incredible power that operates within each one of us, but we've got to lay hold of the promise. It's a life of faith, it's a life of trust. And sometimes we just lose track. Uh, we lose our focus, that's that body of death again. Recently I've uh, talked to a, a young man who I've asked to be my spiritual director, and. Uh, of course, with a spiritual director, what do you expect him to do? You expect him to tell you that, well, you need to meditate this way for a certain amount of minutes a day or whatever it is. That's what I would expect anyway. And, you know, because you got to, that's what my first spiritual director did. He wanted me to be silent for 10 minutes. 10 whole minutes. <laughs> but Jeff said to me, um, now you already know how to do that. I'm not going to tell you to do that. What I want to know 
is what do you yearn for? What do you yearn for? Oh, maybe you yearn for, uh, I don't know, a great new car. Let's go beneath that. Why do you yearn for that? Does it build you up in some way? Does it make you look a way that your heart feels like you need? Well, what's that yearning? What's beneath all this yearning? And what I think you'll find is that the bottom of all of it is this yearning to be connected to the Spirit of God. We forget about it sometimes. We need friends to help us stay the course. Eyes open, recognizing when this spirit is indeed, this yearning within us is indeed flowing through us, expressing itself in the world. So I have a couple of suggestions, things you might think about to connect to that yearning. One of them is quite a commitment and it's not for everybody because we're all called at different moments to do different things in our spiritual walk. But I'd like to work with a group of, I don't know, seven or eight people in the coming year. I I imagine meeting once a month, once I know who the seven or eight people are, we can figure out when. (laughs) But meet once a month. Help one another find what it is that we're yearning for. Help one another study and understand it. Help one another connect to it in spirit. Stand by one another as community brings about something more beautiful than any individual can. Find ways to serve together, but a a time of growth. I'll lead it, but I'm as much a participant in it as I am a leader one thing we might do if you're interested in that if it's something like feel like this might be the moment to take another step forward in a group like this could help you do that that would be great I'd love to talk to you about it but there are simpler ways to attend to the Spirit of God as the Spirit expresses that creative power enacts that force in the world that changes that cycle which has just stayed and spun and spun us down. Barbara and I got an uh, email or a Facebook post from somebody yesterday about a blessing jar. And the se- suggestion was simple. Take a jar, put it somewhere in your house, and all through 2013, when you receive a blessing, when you see the Spirit of God acting upon the world, making it more beautiful, greater and whole, whether it's through you or through others. Just write it down. Put it in the jar. And a year from now, we open up the jar and we read through and see the beautiful things that the Spirit has done when it acts through the law, the Torah. This understanding that God is carrying creation forward, not letting it stay in that cycle that pulls us down. That's the good news and the promise, you know, that lives in the middle of this letter. This is not a letter that's trying to tell you you're bad because you are wretched and uh, have a body that is going to constantly have its passions overwhelming your better self, your better knowledge. No, this is not about saying you're bad. Paul sees very clearly that the spirit of God that imbues all creation, that interpenetrates your life, is always at work expressing this creative power and love that allows us to be growing and becoming more and more beautiful. That's the promise we lay hold of. That's the gospel that we offer.